I think you know a lot of this. Uh, you guys probably know. Uh, this is one of my favorite pictures. Uh, obviously, that's a photo of the United States at night. And uh, if you know what you're looking for, most obviously, this is Houston, right? And, and that's San Antonio, and that's Austin. Uh, and what is this? Uh, that's the Eagle Ford Shale. So that's pretty impressive that you can see it from space because of all the activity. And how many of you that worked on a frag job worked on a frag job in South Texas in the Eagle Ford? Yeah, I mean, so if you've even driven down there at, at night, uh, not so much lately, but uh, you know, a year ago, if you drove down there at night, it's like daylight, you know, because of, one, because of flaring, but also just, there's just a lot of lights on the rigs, right? And there's so many of them down there. Um, so it's, it's pretty impressive. Of course, uh, if we look somewhere else, this is, this is Chicago, right? And uh, so looking out from there, this is North Dakota, right? Obviously no one, you know, no one lives in North Dakota. There's le far less people in all of North Dakota than there is just in Chicago, right? And, and there we can see something that rivals the, you know, the, the lights of the second biggest city or third biggest city in the U.S. out there in the middle of North Dakota again from all the activity. And there's a little, there's uh, other places, of course, out in the Permian Basin, if you know what you're looking for. Um, you know, even last year, in fact, there were more rigs in the Permian Basin than there were in the Eagle Ford Trail. Uh, there was a lot of activity in the Permian Basin. Uh, although the productivity from Eagle Ford Trail, as we'll see, is superior. And then, of course, up in the Marcellus, which you can't really see because of all the other lights on the East Coast, but it's a, it's a big deal. And there's another way to look at it. <coughs> I'm sure you've seen this plot, but if you haven't, uh, I took this down just last month, so it's fairly recent. Since uh, 1920, total U.S. oil production versus you know time. And we reached a peak in around 1970. And then we had this little blip there. Anybody know what that is from? Alaska, right, Prudhoe Bay. So the Prudhoe Bay field uh, had a little increase there and then a steady decline up until the mid-2000s. And then all of a sudden, just this real hockey stick uh, increase uh, in the last couple of years. And of course, this is due to shale oil production and the technology associated with that is, of course, hydraulic fracturing. So we, we've reached the, almost reached the, the maximum from 1970. Uh, we will exceed that, although uh, for the first time in March, uh, for the first time since the shale revolution, at least the production has dropped a little bit uh, because of just a, a little bit uh, backing off on the activity because of the low prices. Uh, we are in Texas. I'm a native Texan, right? Mo most of you are probably native Texans, or at least spent a lot of good time here, right? I mean, uh, who, a good amount of you probably uh, grew up here, spent a lot of time here. So uh, if you look at break down the production by state, this is the this largest, the six largest states, so Texas. California, North Dakota, Oklahoma, Alaska, New Mexico, six largest oil producing states. Which one do you think is Texas? Yeah, so you know, you can add up all the other ones together and they don't add up to what Texas produces. Uh, so, you know, uh, even if you didn't grow up here, if you're going to work in the oil industry, you will very likely spend some time of your life in, in Texas, likely in Houston. So you will be a Texan for, so that's that's something to be proud of or at least interested in. Um, you know, if we break it down by play, uh, you know, a lot of you worked in the Eagle Ford. We're, we're quite close to the Eagle Ford, right? You can drive down there in less than two hours. Uh, if you break it down by play, uh, then this is, the, the Eagle Ford is in blue there, so it's the largest play followed by the Bakken and then the, the Sprayberry uh, and, and Wolf Camp and others are 
in the Permian Basin. And then you see some of the other players, the Marcellus, the Hainesville. This is oil. This is oil, okay. So some of the other players, like particularly uh, the Marcellus, is typically just associated with natural gas. But with gas prices being exceedingly low, even lower than oil, of course, uh, there's not a lot of production. That's one, one reason that the Eagle Ford is so hot uh, is because it did, or does, have a lot of oil in it, uh, particularly in the northern part. Uh, and, you know, you'd have to be living with your head in the ground to not know where the Eagle Ford Shell is. But, of course, uh, it, it runs through about, there's San Antonio there, it runs through about, 20, touches about 22 counties, something like that, uh, over towards Houston. Of course, we all know it stops exactly at the Rio Grande. It doesn't, doesn't go beyond that at all, right? <laughs> of course, that's a joke. Um, if you look at, you know, going back to that satellite photo of the production, the activity quite uh, does stop there, but I think the, the Mexican government is very interested in changing that uh, so that uh, there, in the future there may, may be activity out into, into Mexico. So the, in this, uh, the green area is sort of the, the oil-rich pay zone, uh, followed by uh, uh, condensate and, and gas. And so I, I don't know when this, this is a few years ago, looked like a lot of the activity uh, was being done gas wells uh, in this condensate zone, but uh, you know, if you look at it now, it'd be a, a lot more activity in the in the green there. Uh, another reason it's sort of important uh, from a national sc security perspective, if you care about those kinds of things, um, you know, for the we, we recently overtook Saudi Arabia in, in total production uh, in terms of oil, and, and, and in last year I think we overtook Russia in terms of total production of gas. Again, this is brought on by really the technology of hydraulic fracturing. Uh, so this is a projection of the, the total energy usage. So this, inf this, is, this comes from the energy information agency, which is part of the DOE. They have a lot of useful data. In fact, all of the, I think almost every chart I've put up so far came from there. And you can just go to the website and get that. And so if you're ever faced with giving a talk or, or you know, settling an argument with your relatives, you can just go to the Energy Information Association. And, and in particular, with respect to those total oil production, you can, you can download that basically in real time. You can get those up you know, every day. Uh, so, you know, look, go out looking into the future, um, you know, it's still going to be oil and gas for a long time. And uh, so I, everything I've talked about so far was really with respect to oil, but, but also when you look at that projection and, and where that resources are going to come from, they're predicting that a lot of it's going to come from, from gas. And this has to do with we're converting a lot of power plants from coal to natural gas. Um, you know, it'd be great if we could also convert our vehicles, or but we do need the infrastructure. Um, it's one thing we're sort of missing. I, many years ago, I looked in. Actually, I, have a, I drive a diesel truck, and I wanted to convert it uh, to run on compressed natural gas, but there was nowhere to fill. It was when I lived in San Antonio. There was nowhere to fill up, so. Actually, if you live in Oklahoma City, that you can, uh, there's quite a few places in Oklahoma City to fill up uh, with natural gas. It, I think it's the, it's the most. But even then, I think maybe it's 28 or 30 stations that you could fill up. You know. A lot of fleet services, obviously buses and other things run on natural gas, but as a consumer, we can't really go to those places. So anyway, uh, so gas is going to be a big part of the future as well, and again, I think you all know this, but where does this all come from? It comes from shale, right? Shale um, is an organic rich mud rock, right? Uh, with, that's characteristic, it's very, very low permeability, right? So here's your conventional, say, Mideast reservoirs, where you, you know, on the Darcy scale, 100 to 1,000 Darcy, you basically stick your finger in the ground and it flows out. We, we cannot do that with shale. It's very, very impermeable. So to give you an idea of how impermeable, you know, it takes 
one molecule of natural gas one year to go one meter in shale. So, you know, if you had a, I usually have a cup up here, but you know, a small cup of water like this, or, or you know, small glass of water like this, if you poured it on shale and let it sit, it would take something like 40 years to drain this much. Right? So it's very, very impermeable, and the way we bring it into production is through the technology of hydraulic fracturing. So I took this from this uh, Hydraulic Fracturing 101. It's an SBU paper from 2012 by this guy, George King. Did, did anyone, George King was here last week. He gave a seminar last Monday, a week ago yesterday. Uh, he gave a seminar to the graduate students. He's very kind of, uh, uh, you know, he's been, he worked for Amoco for like 40 years. He's a consultant for Apache, or a senior engineer for Apache now. He's been a consultant before. Uh, but he's really knowledgeable and he's very kind of excitable. He gives fun lectures and everything. So if you ever get a chance to see him talk, I encourage you to do it. But also you can go, and, and this is hyperlink, so if you go to the web page, you can, you can click on that. And I mean, it's like a, you know, most SP papers are 10, 15 pages, 20 pages. This thing is like 100 pages long. Uh, and, and it really just includes lots and lots of information related to hydro hydraulic fracturing. So it's a, it's a good source of information. And, I know I pulled a, a lot of slides 